Uh, hello and welcome to each of uh, the attendees of this webinar. We're so thankful to you for uh, you know investing your time with us. I know there is a lot of time which people have, to, but then you know investing it in the right amount in the right place is also always something which has to be judiciously uh, you know uh, taken as a decision. So um, uh, you know this is a lecture series which uh, Jindal Global Law School has started. We can see that a lot of students are staying at home and. Uh, they want to study There's so much available, but then there are a lot of law students who want to experience law school because how is law taught? How are different different dimensions of uh, legal theories discussed, etc., etc. So that is something which this entire session will be all about. And uh, many of the students also ask us question that you know how are general faculty, etc., etc. So what we have done is we have created a lecture series here right in uh, you know on, on the online mode where. It will, it will start with uh, you know the vice dean himself, and then it will we'll be introducing you slowly to all our faculty, our international faculties, our faculties who teach specific courses. They all will be coming here, and they'll be discussing with you basics of uh, international law, basics of our, our laws, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that will give you a good idea about how law is taught, what are the specific requirement that you might have in law school, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So here I have this golden opportunity of uh, introducing you to Professor S. D. Srijit. He is the vice dean of our uh, law school. He is one of those people, uh, you know, you can say he is a movers and shakers of the entire law school. He is the one who decides many of those uh, uh, critical decisions which uh, are taken in the law school. But much more than that, he is an excellent faculty. Is one of those faculties who is invited by many law schools, including the national law schools, to come and deliver lectures on some very niche areas of law which are just developing. And when we were conceptualizing this, uh, I remember you know he was the one who came in front and said that okay, I'll be delivering the inaugural address because I want to interact with students and I want to put the idea forth that what is global law. So this entire session is on global law, and I don't find anyone better than Shrijit sir who can come and discuss. You know that topic with you. So you know, I pass it over to uh, Shrijit sir. Uh, he'll be delivering the lecture, and I'll be here. And at the end of the session, I'll come back. And if there are some questions uh, relating to admissions and relating to any other things, we'll be discussing it with you. Okay. So over to you, Shrijit sir. Thank you, Deepu. Thank you very much. Uh, this this topic has some level of appropriateness uh, because global is the middle name of. Uh, Jindal Global Law School and also OP Jindal Global University. So that's that's exactly the reason why the topic has been chosen, uh, the relevance of uh, studying global law in modern times. So before I, I go on into the depth of the topic, let me try to give some uh, terminological clarifications. First of all, I would like to discuss with you what exactly is the meaning of the term global. And then we'll talk about what exactly is the meaning of the term law before I'll go ahead to talk about this fine combination global law and then some of the contemporary things and how uh, studying global law will make one a better informed individual in the modern times. First of all, the global, people often associate the term global uh, with a space in the very Carl Sagan sense of a globe being a pale blue dot when viewed from the distant spaces, but that's not the globe in the global law. Or that's not the glo global in the in, in, you know when we when we use the expression global studies or that's not the sense in which Jindal Global Law School has also used the expression global as its middle name. So my simple point is that globe is not a space. Global is not a space, but rather global is a time. Now what time is this? I would say that philosophers call this time a late modern time. That means that there was a modernity uh, which we transcended. To reach to this modern time, which is called as the late modern time. If you ask me exactly when this global time started, my answer would be that probably somewhere towards the late 1980s. It was a very rare transformation that happened during this time. So people who were born in the 1970s and 80s, uh, fortunate to lead into the 90s and into the new millennium, can very well understand that the world at that time was undergoing substantial transformations. I'm going to capture a few such transformations uh, so that you know my, uh, my my lecture makes more sense to you that why it is relevant to study global law during this time. So that the changes that happened in the 1980s was unlike any other transformations that happened in the past. 
this was an absolutely rare shift from old times to the new times. But this time, the new time mysteriously took away our own sense of familiarity with the old time. I think I, I, I can clarify this in a much more uh, better sense. You all on a sudden woke up one fine morning to find that you have no memories of your old world but you have absolute memories of all the knowledge about the old world, but you have no memory of the experiences you had about the old world. So this, is, this reminds me of a very famous fiction by Umberto Eco, the novel, uh, The Mysterious Flames of Queen Ilona, where the protagonist has an accident. And after the accident, he absolutely cannot memorize any of his old experiences, but he can remember every line of the books he has read. We found ourselves in such a situation in the global or in the postmodern world, in the late modern world, that one morning we woke up and we found that the world has substantially transformed. We have every memory of everything we studied, but we have absolutely no memory of the experiences of the old world, or rather those experiences collapsed before our own eyes. Um, that's why I mentioned that the new time mysteriously took away all the sense of familiarity we had, uh, we had with our old times. This substantially affected our own identities. The identity of being a human, the identity of being an entity. So human beings were desperately searching for their identities. States were searching for identities. Corporations were searching for their identities. Now, this is not all a philosophical movement that it just happened to some people in their uh, transcendental meditative states. Literally, there were marked signs of this transformation. Two prominent examples. One is the collapse of the Soviet Union that happened in 1989 a massive empire, a mighty empire collapsed without any substantial reasons. And that collapse is nothing but the collapse of the previous time, the collapse of the modernity and the emergence of the late modernity. We too witnessed the fall of the Berlin Wall. So these two collapses are actually historical manifestations of the, of the, of the, the collapse of the time and the entry into the new time. Now the time in which we lived all on a sudden became unknown to us. It became alien to us. And those people who sense to that there is a new food culture emerging in your city, there are new banks coming in your city, there are new cars on your roads, you are actually, or you were actually experiencing the global or the new late modern society. So when I was a school student, I all on a sudden found that there is a British bank of the Middle East emerging in my city. I couldn't make sense why there is a new bank. All on a sudden, the roads which were dominated by the ambassadors, the Maruti and the Fiat were replaced by imported cars. So actually, that was exactly the transformation that was happening around the world. It was dramatic. It was phenomenal. Now, this is also the time when we began to witness the rise of the middle class. All on a sudden, the middle class started to gain prominence in the world. Middle class began to emerge as the decision makers in the modern social production. And also, middle class began to grow richer. The movement of the people substantially increased in the world. So these were some of the major transformations that the world has undergone in the early uh, 90s and in the post 1980s. There is a beautiful term to explain all these changes and the new world that has emerged. I'm sure that all of you have heard this term, that term political scientists have coined, they call it globalization. Now this is a term I'm sure that everybody heard. So what exactly is this globalization and how the global is relevant for that? Answer is very simple, one fine morning, one fine day, we found ourselves in a new, new circumstances. You were alien to the new circumstances. You felt a strangeness to even yourself, not only to your surroundings. And you decided that you are going to grapple with the strangeness which you got and grappling with. The process of the grappling with is what exactly we call as globalization. Now I'll come to that in a short uh, uh, while, but before that, let me also tell you what exactly is the role of law here why we actually talked about the global law as such. Why can't the discourse be purely on globalization? So to sum up, global is not a space. Global is a time and the time in which we live. A time of confusion, a time of surprises, a time of lack of coherence, and a time of all amusements. This is absolutely a bewitching time as well, if you are aware of what exactly is happening around you. Now, law. So how can why, why law is so relevant to this discourse? If you ask this very simple question, what exactly is law? The simplest answer one can give is that law is that which shows people the right ways of living. So that means that anything that shows the right ways of living will qualify as law. Even if it's a statute, even if it's an ordinance, or even the counsel of a grandparent, if it shows you the right ways of living, that will qualify as a law. This is the most simplest and the basic understanding uh, uh, one can have about the law. 
But the rightness which the law obtained by showing right ways is what exactly we call as an order. So law aims to establish an order and law aims to establish the order by showing the people the right ways of living. When the right ways match with the expected ways, we will have order in the society. So the rightness which the law obtained by showing people the right base is what we call as the order and in a society that's actually the social order. So the function of the law in the society is to show the people the right base. Now this is how law was classically understood. But all on a sudden when we moved into a new world when modernity collapsed, the functions of the law in the society also collapsed. That means that law cannot be that thing which shows you the right base. There is no preconceived truth in law. Law cannot tell you anymore what is right and what is wrong. Because when the entire memory collapsed, when the entire experience collapsed, the concept of the function of law in a society too collapsed, it too failed, it too fall in, fell in that process. So as, as a part of our move into the new world, and with the transformation of everything around us, the functions of the law in the society also got, got threatened. So in new times, we call it the global times, we need a new law. So that means the law that will govern these troubled times in which we live, or the law that governs these confusing times, these surprising times, that law is what we would call as the global law. Now I'll tell you more about this global law, but I would like to speak a little bit more about the globalization and the strangeness that this globalization has brought to us. I would also like to draw your attention to some of the present circumstances surrounding us, the, 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 the tragic pandemic, uh, the COVID-19 as well. So I mentioned that after the 90s, the world moved into the globalized world or a globalizing world. Uh, globalization has an economic theory of its own and not harping on it at this moment. I'm simply going to talk about how globalization affected our minds, how globalization affected the society as a collective mind and how the concept of the law got transformed in the process. So globalization is new conditions and altogether new time and the management of the affairs in this new time. We also have a very fancy term for this kind of collective management which we are doing at all levels of our life. It's called global governance. So global governance means that you are governing the mess created by the new time, the late modernity. So you can also do this at a micro level. So when you govern the affairs of this global time at large, you call it global governance. At a more micro level, when companies reorganize in the aftermath of globalization, we call it corporate governance. When police reorganize, we call it police governance. When prison re are reorganized, we call it prison governance. When environment is reorganized, we call it environmental governance. So it goes so, so you know, uh, uh, so on and so forth like that. Because governance can happen at a global level. You, you collectivize all these small efforts. You call it the global governance. And governance can also happen at particular walks of the life. As I mentioned, police governance, environmental governance, corporate governance, trade governance, many such governance. So next time when you hear the term governance, please understand that it's not a loose term. It's a much weightier term, which has actually a heavy, uh, heavy a bigger meanings attached to that. Now, something interesting about this global times, I said that we moved from uh, modernity to late modernity, pre-global to global. The sad thing about the global is that this is not a stable time nothing is predictable. I said that you never know what exactly is going to happen in your next moment. So globalization, the new time was never a stable time and it is never going to be stable either. The more you try to stabilize, the more it will push you off the rails. So never ever try to find stability or find a certain coherence, find a certain linearity in the global time. It's going to give you all surprises. You know that it has given us surprises and this happens in varied forms. It happens in the form of uh, financial recession. It happens in the form of terrorism. It happens in the form of natural disasters. It happens in the form of social setbacks. It happens in the form of epidemics and at times and more recently as a pandemic, the COVID-19. So COVID-19, I would consider that as one of the phase, the globalization or one of the phase that actually the global has shown to us. Let's investigate this into a little bit more so that I make it more clear why COVID-19 can be associated with globalization and uh, the, the state of affairs of the law therein. So I, I would ask three questions before that, and then I'll tell you a very interesting um, anecdote which I've read in a book, and then we'll go ahead explaining the COVID-19 and why COVID-19 is, uh, is, is, is nothing but uh, uh, yet another phase of the global times. So first of all, three, question, uh, three questions. One is, how is COVID-19 related to the global times? Second question, how is COVID-19 related to law? And third is, how is COVID-19 COVID related to global law? 
let's look at, uh, before we answer these uh, three questions, let me tell you a very interesting uh, anecdote, uh, which I read in the book uh, by Justin Goddard with the title, The Ringmaster's Daughter. So in this book, there is a particular scenario. Uh, it's a virus, a virus with the name Amazonian virus struck the whole world. It's, it absolutely devastated the world and just left 339 individuals living in the whole world. But these 339 individuals had some kind of a contact through the internet. The rest of the world is, is, is gone. I mean, it has gone, gone back to eternity. So of these 85 people lived in Tibet, 28 people lived in Seychelles, 52 in Northern Alaska, 128 in uh, Spitsbergen, 11 in Madrid, and six in London. So you can see that literally the world's population got absolutely scattered into tiny clusters and the only way for them is to connect to each other. So all of a sudden this world, which, I mean, which, was, which was created in the aftermath of this devastation by the Amazonian virus, had a few set of individuals you know, clustered and scattered all over the world. Now in this story, all the rail and the road network remains intact because only the people disappeared from the world, not the rail and the road networks. Oil reserves remain as intact. But the problem is that the road and the rail networks remain, but there are no more train drivers, there are no more truck drivers. Oil reserves remain as it is, but there is no one who has the specialist knowledge to extract the oil for the benefit of these 339 people. Most of the planes in the world are ready to take off in the runway, but there are no pilots to fly the plane. Satellites are transmitting various signals about weather disasters, about the, I mean, different geological and geographical things, but there is no expert to read these satellite signals in the world. We have 385 people, all the 385 people, all 339 people, all the 339 people have the desire to leave. Their only question is that, how are we going to leave? We have everything in the world we need, but we have no one who actually can use these things. I mean, the, the saddest thing is that people want to travel, meet with each other. There are planes ready on the runway, absolutely fueled, but there is no pilot to fly the plane. Now, how these people will reorganize? This is actually the strangeness I talk about. But the 339 people alive, they are people with desires. They are people with dreams. They don't want to die. They want to meet each other. They want to be together. But how can they be together? All on a sudden, you know, that world meant something else for you, not what it was before. I know that this is not the appropriate time to tell the story, but it, it tells about the strangeness, the absolute strangeness which you experienced. Now here, people have new relationship because these 339 people, they are connected through the internet. They were the people who never knew before. One in Tibet, a few in Seychelles, a few in Northern Alaska. They have to invent new relations among themselves. There are new relations which are going to emerge because of the crossbreeding of these people. These people will have new approaches to life. Everything left behind will have to be found new use. I mean, this reminds me that when at some point when government of India announced that we are going to use all the trains, all the trains which are now unused because of the, 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 the strike by the COVID-19 as hospitals, I was just thinking that. I mean, that was not, that, that's not the trains were meant to be. But all of a sudden the trains, the air conditioned compartments of the trains found a new use here. So this is, the, this is the character of globalization that you never know what is awaiting you, what surprise is awaiting you. So trains were supposed to become hospitals in COVID-19 that is a new use of the trains. There is a renewed importance to all the online courses and webinars in the COVID-19. People have started to settling down to the reduced standards in all walks of life. We were ambitious individuals, but COVID-19 has prompted us to accommodate to the current reality. We have now, we are not aspirational anymore. We are willing to reduce our standards and the old and the reduced standards have become the new normal. They have become the new standards. Look at that. We have been transformed into an absolutely new world. So COVID-19 is just one phase in these global times. I hope by now it's very clear to you that global is not the globe. Global is not the pale blue dot, but global is actually the time, the strange time which is around us, in which we live, which is in the offing, which is all, which has all surprises for us. So COVID-19 is one such phase in the global times. And perhaps this is one of the worst phases in, uh, in the existence of humanity, or probably one of the worst phases in the existence of the modern generation or the current generation. It literally challenged the way we cared for, or it, it literally challenged
Okay, uh, we might have lost Sir's connection. He'll be back in a moment. Uh, by that time, I think uh, uh, you you all are uh, enjoying the session. Uh, for the questions, there are a few questions which have already come up. So by the time Sir comes back, I think I should answer those questions for you. Uh, uh, someone asked me, is this session going to help you in LSAT? Uh, see, LSAT is basically a test which does not test you on your rot learning skills. It basically tests you on some specific skills, uh, which are logical reasoning and also your English. So when you attend sessions like this and you get multiple levels of perspectives and you get to hear multiple different, different kinds of views. For example, sir was discussing about COVID. Who knows uh, this year else are they going to ask you certain questions about how to tackle COVID uh, and how, you know, what are the various dimensions relating to it? So LSAT as a test, tests specifically on students in a, in, a, in, a, in a very psychological manner that tests you whether when given in a particular scenario, what are the reactions amongst those given four options you're going to choose. So when you listen to such kind of lectures and specifically, believe me, LSAT is very much uh, connected to law schooling and how, you know, uh, uh, because when you when you get taught law in law school, it's not like a faculty would come and he will just read the section and he will just narrate what happened in the case law. On the other hand, he will say, okay, this is a section, uh, this is the case law, this is how it was applied, but think about its evolution with the change in times, like what is happening today. Like, you know, um, I, I read an article when I was in law school, which said that most of the constitutions have a lifespan of about, the maximum lifespan of about 30 years to 40 years. And I, I hope all of you know that uh, we, we are more than a 50 year old constitution. So challenging those set orders and challenging those set sections and rights is something which law teaches you, for which you need to have multiple dimensions and multiple ways of learning. And such kind of lectures are going to help you. So if you ask me whether this lecture is going to help you in uh, uh, LSAT, I think yes, provided you sit down, you make notes, you think, you go read, and then you come back. Someone as in Shubhangi Avasti asked me that, will interview be conducted in the admission process? Let me tell you, for the five-year program, we do not conduct any interview. Uh, we only solely base uh, our uh, selection process on the basis of LSAT. That's the examination which we uh, take. So there is no interview which we conduct as of now because see things are changing you know uh, i was just notified that clat has also been again postponed so it's not in our hands as in law we say it's all happening because of act of god you know god is making us act like that so you never know but as of now our selection process never has had any interview for lnm etc yes we do conduct interviews because they are the kind of courses for which we would require to we would require once to at least interact with. So in that process, you know, we do it for the five-year program. Uh, LSAT is only criteria through which we select students. Okay. Uh, are there any, any upcoming lectures related to specifics of LSAT? Yes, obviously we are going to have an interview of last year's LSAT toppers. So she and then there are there were three toppers. So I'm trying to rope in the other two also, but uh, one of them has agreed. She was our student, she has joined Jindal also. She's right now in Qatar. So she has uh, uh, consented that she'll come on board and we'll be conducting an interview where, you know, someone coming and telling you, like me, that for LSAT, this has to be done, et cetera. I think you should hear this right. right? Okay, so we have uh, Sir back. So, Sir, please continue with the session. I was just uh, discussing- I don't know which point I lost him. <laughs> yeah, so internet, it, it does happen. So it's okay, you can continue. No, no, at which point, where was I? Because I didn't realize that my connection is lost. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, I, I guess uh, you were discussing uh, one minute. Even I, I did not keep track of it. <laughs> I was writing down the questions and I was answering to a few students. Can anyone give us an idea where sir was? He stopped at COVID-19. Got it, got it, got it. Thank you, Vyas. New normal. New normal. Okay, continue. Right. So uh, I said that there is a new world which has all the time surprises in the offing for us. There are a lot of surprises for us in the offing. And uh, I hope I've completely, I mean, you heard my, I mean, what I was talking about, the rule of law. So all of a sudden there is a new normal. And the new normal we have is nothing but stay at your home. So previously, the rule of law or the, the functions of the law in the society, the law which told us the right ways of living, wanted us to stay 
uh, wanted us to come out the world and participate in the global process. All on a sudden, there was a dramatic U-turn. Now the new normal is staying inside the home. So if the if law is the right base of living, that right base of living has dramatically changed in the global world. So I've mentioned also that uh, probably uh, maybe I missed this part. I'll just recap it quickly. Uh, so COVID-19 is nothing but a new phase in the global times. The global times are all surprises for us. Even my internet going out was a surprise for me. So COVID-19 has uh, global times. Uh, global times have all surprises for us, and COVID-19 is one such surprise. Probably one of the worst phase we are actually facing. Now, this COVID-19 has actually substantially redefined the human life, which is exactly what the global times does to us. One is, uh, you know, that we have a new life, self-isolation. Uh, we have new nature of work. Human contact has a new meaning today. Human relationships assumed a new meaning. Even we have a new rule of law. And I was talking exactly about that, how rule of law transformed during, during this period. So previously, coming outside your house was something rule of law set for you to fulfill your social obligations. Now coming outside your house is a breach of your social role. So that means that the new, new social role expects you, or the new rule of law expect you, expects you actually to stay back at home and do your work. We have all of a sudden new categories of people, all the previous identities, judges, lawyers, uh, professionals, pilots, everything collapsed. And we have new people now that new people with new title, isolated individuals, quarantined individuals, infected individuals, people performing essential services, medical professionals, foreign returnees. We changed a lot without even knowing humanity changed a lot in the last few weeks. So my point is that COVID-19 is a phase of the global. It is just one of the phase of the global, probably the worst phase which the global times have shown us. What exactly is the right way of living now is substantially different from what exactly was the right way of living in the past. Now, I perhaps need not tell you that why the term global law is relevant. The first point is that global law has to be the new functions of law in global times. So we live in troubled times. We live in time with surprises. We live in time where everything has been lost and we are in a process of rediscovery. So whatever teaches you that process of rediscovery and reinvention, that's exactly what we call as global law. So first thing, uh, the aspiring students of the law should understand is that global law is not a branch of law. There is global law in family law. There is global law in international law. There is global law in criminal law. So whenever the previous laws or the, the, the very imagination which criminal law had, family law had, law of thought had, law of trade had, when they collectively reinvent that process in the global times, we call that law the global law. So global law is just a character which actually the various branches of the law will assume. When the international trade law will be grappling with certain major trade issues, which is actually setting up the balance of payment problem of the states, or which is actually pushing the balance of payment uh, of, of the states, in such a case, you are actually grappling with the global law. <clears throat> so there is no such disciplinary category called a global law. Whenever law fulfills the functions in the global times, so then uh, the, the government of Kerala or the government of Tamil Nadu or the government of Delhi is issuing a new circular saying that whoever is found on the streets uh, during the lockdown, they shall be penalized. Now here we are talking global law. This is actually the global law because we are talking about a statute or an ordinance or a circular or a notification which is actually issued during a pandemic, during a crisis, which is one of the phase of the global. So I hope this, you, you got the summary. Global law is definitely not a branch of law, but it is a condition, a condition and a newer imagination which actually the existing laws have assumed. I'll illustrate this further. But Quite often, there is a misunderstanding uh, among uh, you know, uh, the, the students and also among many people that global law is a new name for international law. That international law, the term international, which was coined by Jeremy Bentham, has become very old fashioned. And we live in a new time, so we should have a new, new name. That's not right. Global law is not international law. But still, there is a myth, <coughs> a myth that goes around. So the interesting question is that how this myth has come about? How this myth has come into existence, why people often think that international law is global law and all other laws are local law or all other laws are domestic law. I would tell you the myth. This is because people consider global as a space. So I started my lecture with the caveat that global is not a, uh, a, a space, but global is a time. But then you consider globe in a material sense, you are likely to mistake globe as a space. And that space is an expansiveness, you know, spread across the entire world. So here, globe is mistaken as a bright blue ball. Otherwise, globe is mistaken as the earth. 
and the global law is often mistaken as the law that governs the earth. That's absolutely a wrong perception. It's a myth. Uh, global law is not international law. I've already clarified global law is any law that actually deals with contemporary realities, that grapples with contemporary uh, challenges. That law will be uh, global law. So I said that even a notification issued by a village officer in order to safeguard the people there from a global crisis that too is actually a global law. So it's a little bit uh, paradoxical that, you know, a, a global law can function very well at a local level, but that's actually, or that's in fact the case. Now, mistaking global laws, international law, you know, that goes much deeper than what I have said. People often think that it's a new name, but it goes much deeper than that. The reason why people often equate global law with international law is that international law has a character, we often call it the universalizing character. That means that international law can unite all the people and the world together. It unites states and the people into one entity. And this actually international law mainly, uh, United Nations started it mainly through the promise of peace, the human peace, the collective peace, the world peace, through which it universalized to the entire world. It is this universalizing possibilities of international law, which actually prompted even many scholars to mistakenly think that global law is the new international law. So in fact, as I've mentioned, it's because of a misperception that global is a space, global is the globe. So global is just a time, a late modern time. As much as global is the law of the new times, we have a new family law, we have a new labor law, we have a new international law, but global law is not international law per se. So any law which actually assumes the character or which actually assumes the character of a global law, that will be called as a global law. I've mentioned anything that regulates the modern times is the global law. Now, uh, global law is, uh, as I said, it has also, it, 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 studying global law also gives us a lot of confidence because global law is also about opportunities because global law gives you alternative imaginations. Global law gives you new avenues of thinking. It gives you food for thought. So in that sense, for a law student, global law is going to be all exciting because here you have an opportunity to critique. Here you have a space to represent yourself. Here you have a space to manifest your, uh, your identity as an individual with identity and then make your point here. So let me clarify this. Uh, conventional imagination, law is a command. And rule of law is a subconscious subordination to that command. So whatever the law says, we perceive that it is right. I'm repeating, the conventional understanding of law is that law is a command given by the sovereign state. This is a classic understanding of law. And rule of law is nothing but the individual's own subconscious subordination to the command uh, given by the law. So we don't say that there is no good law or bad law. All law is good because law speaks the truth. Hence, law is right. Now, when you study global law, you, you deviate, you depart from this conventional imagination. Global law is not a command. In global, law is actually information which will help you to make a good choice. To, to help you to fulfill your desires. So in other words, law is information. Law is no more a command and information which will help you to make a rational choice. So in that case, what is rule of law? Rule of law is a framework created by the law within which rational decisions can be taken. So here there is no right, there is no wrong. If you take a decision and if the decision is rational, that is the rightness of it. So in global law, there is no more truth. Truth also comes in subjectivities. Truth comes in, uh, uh, you know, uh, previously truth used to be objective, one truth. Now that's not the case. You have actually multiple truths in the global law. So whichever position you take, and if your position is rational, that actually decision is often called as the truth. So there is a, there's a, there's a, there's a substantial departure from the conventional imaginations of the law to newer imaginations, and global law provide that. Not only that, global law gave us so many new subjects. It not only gave us new imaginations, it gave us new subjects. Who are these new subjects? All on a sudden, you know that the Supreme Court of India recently uh, recognized the uh, identity of the sexual minorities. So all on a sudden, we have actually a new subject. We have new representations. We have actually new sexuality. Now, actually, in the new sexuality, the world is not anymore governed by, the global time is not anymore governed by the male-female binary. There are also other sexualities which are actually existing within that. So the global law gave us new subjects and some of the new subjects is all on a sudden the people living in the global peripheries, like people living in the third world, they also got an opportunity. The center of the world substantially shifted from the old centers to the newer centers, China, Russia, India, Brazil, and new centers are emerging in the world. And people living in the new centers all on a sudden shoot into prominence. New representations, new sexualities, newer identities. 
so global law is not all a global is not bad time global is also a fantastic time because it is a time of opportunities it is a time for newer imaginations so in sum uh, globalization and the global law if you talk about that, uh, that that relationship i would say that globalization is also changing its character substantially the globalization is changing its character in 1990s when the world moved into the global uh, we thought that this is going to uh, spread outward and outward and outward and outward like a spiral but that's not exactly what happened i mentioned at some point that don't ever expect stability in the global world stability is not the norm here instability is actually the norm of the global law you have surprises all the time before celebrating christmas none of us thought that 2020 three months or four months we are going to stay in isolation in quarantine redefining our identities redefining our relationships redefining our own existence global is there all with all surprises so initially when globalization uh, started we thought that the world is going to shrink world is going to be smaller and smaller there will be a world government there will be a single world but actually globalization later on showed that that's not in fact the case now the modern globalization is not an outward movement it's actually an inward spiraling we are actually more and more turning inward look at russia russia is in the process of inventing russianness china is trying to find chineseness britain in the name of brexit is trying to find britainness america is looking at Americanness, India is looking at Indianness. So the states of the world today no more are concerned about moving outwards, but actually the states are actually moving inwards more and more into their own local identities. Now there is a problem here. Every state, because states are not comfortable with the new global identity which have been given to them, new identity which has been given to them. So the states are actually trying to search their identity. This is a journey backwards. So they're, they're going backwards, inner and in, inner into their universal self. But the problem is that at some point they they stop at a very historically advantageous point and say that herein lies my identity. So globalization is also changing its character. It's changing its character in such a way that it's no more outward globalization. Globalization is not spreading to the entire world, but it's more moving inward and discovering your identity and then interacting with the rest of the world. Now comes a question where this global law is actually going or what is actually the future of the global law? Uh, I mentioned that global law is not a discipline, but global law is actually any law that governs these troubled times or any law that helps us lead a meaningful life, sensing our own reality, discovering our own identities, fulfilling our own existential realities. We call that the global law. Now, one of the modern, one of the trends of the global law is that there is a domestic turn. I write, I've mentioned just before, we are turning more and more local rather than more and more global. But we, we, our presence will be there in the global, but our identities our thought process actually comes more from the local. Uh, there is actually a turning inward. I've mentioned that. So every turn inward and the imagination you're going to bring from that inward position, that's actually going to be an alternative imagination. So that means that globalization gives you an opportunity to think fresh, think new, alternative imaginations. Another important facet of the globalization is that utopia. Utopia all on a sudden became so relevant for you because utopia, we all used to have a fancy at utopia, but today utopia is relevant because what you dreamed as a, what you thought of as a utopia is all on a sudden becoming reality. This is exactly the reason why some of the postmodern fiction writers like Haruki Murakami, Umberto Iko, Justin Goddard, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, they are all actually trying to bring in fantabulism to their own respective novels so that we, the readers, are introduced to these newer realities and newer imaginations and we acclimatize to it and get acclimatized to it because we never know what is in the offing in the global. Um, as I've mentioned, every branch of the law is being reimagined thanks to the influence of the global. Family law has new subjects now. Constitutional law. Now, Article 370 of the Indian Constitution, all on a sudden, Article 370 has a newer meaning. And we have to now understand the Constitution and that particular clause with a newer light, with a newer perspective. There is largely a legitimacy crisis as well because the old notion of the legitimacy also changed. So global law gives you the confidence that now you have a space, now you have a time, now you have an opportunity to speak whatever you thought. So nothing is insignificant in the global law. Even a faint idea you have during your transcendental, meditate, transcendental meditative state also becomes an input for a larger social and universal reordering in the global law. But global law, um, uh, I would say that uh, is, is all encompassing because we know that there is no nothing in the world which is free from the clutches or free from the influence of the global law. So to summarize it, I would say that global law so i said that global is a time and global law is actually a sensibility 
It is a postmodern sensibility or a late modern sensibility. It is, an, it is a fine sensibility. So this has a futurism. This is a postmodern consciousness. This has no disciplinary status because it is your consciousness, it is your sensibility. So you cannot say that global law is a new discipline sensu, sensu stricto. There is nothing objective here. There is no truth. There is multiple truth. So whatever you feel right, whatever gives you fulfillment and that gives you fulfillment to the rest of the world, we call that the global law. It has a broader space for political considerations. This is something very important for lawyers because till 80s or till 90s, we actually used to keep law and politics strictly apart. We used to keep law and morality apart. Now everything is getting enmeshed here. Law is politics now. Law is morality. There is no agent. There is no candidate today which can be kept outside the legal imagination. So politics and law are unabashedly enmeshing in the modern times. There is nothing called the politics. I will not touch it. It's politics. I will only deal with law. Law is per se politics in the global because you cannot uh, ignore one aspect of the global, which is politics. Global law influences our thought and action. It is actually the, the thought and action of the self which is lost in the tempest of modernity. But most important, global law gives us hope. Global law gives us salvation because global law is going to help us discover our own self identities. This is the reason why universities across the world today has made a big move towards the global law. So when Jindal Global Law School promises that we are going to teach you global law through global curriculum, global pedagogy, global faculty members, we simply mean that here, we have a set of people, we have set of practices, we have set of norms which actually match exactly with these troubled times in which we live. It's more important to know that you are in this time. Once you have the sense of your own situationality that you are in global time, everything else you do will have a meaning and will have a purpose. Thank you very much. I will now take your questions. Great session, sir. And most of the questions which students are asking are relating to admissions, but there are some really interesting questions. Uh, one of the questions is asked by uh, Sagnik Sarkar. Uh, the student wants to know the impact of uh, COVID-19 in modern international relations between the countries. Right? How is it you know, going to impact the modern international okay. relations? The question is asked yeah, by Sagnik. Yeah, Sadnik, thank you Sadnik, for your question. It's a little bit early to make uh, uh, you know, authoritative comments about uh, authoritative comments on how this is going to impact uh, international relations at large. But as I've mentioned, you can see that newer identities are emerging all the time. Even states have a new meaning. There is a new rule of law. There is a new approach coming in. For example, boundaries are now closed. States are guarding their boundaries in a jealous manner than ever before. So now the healthy international relations in this pandemic times that close your borders right so i'm saying that it's a little bit early to predict but there is a time when this is all going to abate we are going to make two, we are making so many hasty decisions now all these decisions will be reconsidered we will find that many of the decisions we have taken in international relations including closing of the border suspension of the services everything were wrong decisions but we don't need to regret over the decisions we have actually taken because those are the decisions taken in the uh, taken in time of a pandemic or taken during, again, one of the worst phases of the uh, global. So what I'm saying is that there is nothing for a right or a wrong in this global. At the moment, we are actually taking heuristic decisions. Heuristic decisions means all decisions we have taken. We don't think about the legitimacy of this, 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 the decisions we are taking. We are simply seeing how can it give us solution for the immediate future. That's the simple thing we are thinking about. I mean, you know, so uh, at the moment, it's a little bit difficult to predict. There is going to be a lot of review about a lot of review about the decisions taken during this uh, pandemic. But international relations have not stopped. So even the states shutting down the shutting down their boundaries as of now, and uh, different foreign policies adopted by the states during the pandemic, which may be an inclusion more than you know, which which may be an, yeah, which may be which may not be inclusion, which is actually exclusion. But even the exclusion is not a bad decision because that exactly was the decision which was needed at that point of time. It's a little bit early to predict actually how international law and international relations will evolve. But as I've mentioned that in this time, whatever rule of law is being followed, that makes sense, right? Okay, great, sir. So uh, we have another question from Siri Wadula. Her uh, question is, what's the equivalent LLB degree in USA and European countries and how
I think I I heard your question. Um, I think we lost Mr. Deepu uh, in the in the process. So I'm going to respond to that question. Uh, what exactly is the equivalent of uh, LLB or LLM in uh, Europe and United States? So we, you, 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 some of you may know that in United States, there is a degree called the Juris Doctor. It is actually the JD. So JD is actually the, a, a professional degree in law. But one can join the JD only after completing four years of education in United States four years of college in United States. So basically JD is a graduate degree, even though it's called a Juris Doctor, it's definitely not a doctoral degree, but there is a lot of academic rigor in JD, which at times makes it equivalent to the kind of imaginations you generally will have when doing a doctoral degree. In Europe, the trend is slightly different. And of course, you know, anybody who completes their, uh, completes their undergraduate college, which could be a BA or an AB or a BSc or a BS in United States, they will be able to uh, appear for the law school uh, American LSAT, the law school admissions test conducted by the LSAC. And based on that score, they generally find admission to the law schools in the United States. Please note that American law schools do not accept any test other than the LSAC. So if anybody wants to join the JD program, the only option for them is to, the only option for them is actually to uh, go through the LSAC model. Now in Europe, the trend is uh, slightly different. The trend is slightly different in Europe. In Europe, uh, uh, I mean, in many jurisdictions, there is nothing like a bachelor's degree. So they have actually a combined degree, which they call LLM. So in India and in United States, LLM is a master's degree, but in many European jurisdictions, there is no bachelor's degree. They actually pursue a five-year program, a five-year program, uh, a five-year program, which actually is a bachelor's degree and a master's degree combined. So most of the schools in Europe select students to this combined bachelor's master's program through their own respective entrance examinations. So in United States, it is the LSAC, for the JD program, and in Europe, the route through which you can gain admission to the law school is actually the respective entrance examination of the schools. Now, JD is definitely a fantastic program. So are the programs run by many uh, European universities. But I said that the influence of the global the effort to adopt global standards are being followed by universities across the world. But there is no uniform structure of legal education, but yet th there, there is a uniform standard, a uniform quality, which is actually emerging all over. Let me try to see the question. Um, So if uncertainty and the challenging of norms is a characteristic of global law, does it have the capability of undermining the old certain and cemented perception of law? If yes, is it good or bad? Well, uh, uh, I've mentioned at some point that there was a substantial transformation in the very imagination of law because previously law meant uh, something which is good for the entire society and that law was enforced over the society through some kind of uh, imperatives. That means that we believe that the law has a, uh, a certain inherent, uh, uh, inherent command and that command has to be followed by everything. But then in a global world, uh, in the global times, we are also living in the time of numerous choices. So you should know what exactly is your right choice. So when you have information which is uh, sufficient to make, it, uh, make the choices, you will make the good choices. So in the modern perception, in the global, what exactly the law should provide you is that adequate information so that you can make a rational choice. I mean, if you look at this, uh, there's even a theory called a rational choice theory, where it is believed that law is nothing but a receptacles of information, receptacles of information, which will help you make a strategic choice. This also goes back deeper into some very interesting theories, like, you know, that in the, in the previous time, we believed that human being is basically altruistic who is seeking peace and who will follow anything you say. But in the global world, individual is basically considered to be self-interested and egoistic. And an egoist, egoistic individual is always looking for the fulfillment of their own desires. So for the fulfillment of the desires, the law cannot prohibit an individual by way of bans and mandates. What actually the law should do here is provide individuals with maximum inputs. That is actually the change to perception from the old command theories to the new uh, rational choice theories of law. So whether this is good or bad is a difficult question. The goodness and the badness in the global times will be decided based on, uh, you know, based on whether it fulfills your ambition or not. So fulfillment of the desires, making appropriate choices, they became more relevant in the global times.
Right now I can see that. Will global law help the different countries to come out of the COVID-19 situation? Yes. So it's not about that. Uh, I mean, I'll also tell you that whatever measures are taken by these different states, whatever measures are taken by the different states in order to combat this crisis, all those measures, all those uh, Yeah, I hope I'm uh, visible now. So uh, all those measures which are taken by these states in order to combat this global crisis, they come under global law. So as I said that, in order, in order to call something a global law, it need not have that law. Anything that helps you address the immediate crisis before you, anything that helps you to make appropriate choices, you call that the global law. So every measure which is being taken, be that quarantine, be that self-isolation, be that blocking the borders, or be that uh, you know tracking the route of the COVID patient, everything comes under uh, your own, um, everything comes, comes as a global response to the, the pandemic. But I'm sure that the very nature of the global law is also going to transform when the COVID will abate. Then we will have newer solutions. That newer solutions will also come under the global law. So don't uh, uh, think that global law is exactly uh, global i mean global law can be judged with the conventional lens of law which is actually enacted by the parliament which is actually in the form of a statute in the form of an ordinance anything that helps you or anything that helps you combat uh, against uh, against against these uh, i mean odds of your time and anything that helps you sail through this global you call that the global law so please understand this global law is not a law in the strict sense but global law is a response response of the world to the global times Okay, so there was one more interesting question by Purni Singh. She wants to know that if the pandemic is going to be like this and it's going to extend, will all the classes be online? Sorry. Will all the classes be online then? And then she's looking after a, <laughs> into a future. So I, 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 already, I, I mentioned this because you know that this has changed our lives. It has changed our lives in a manner which we have never experienced it before. I said that when we were all about to celebrate Christmas, none of us thought that the rest of the three months or four months of our life will be in isolation or maybe in quarantine, maybe in hospitals or with newer identities with uh, newer thinking. So we do not know exactly, but it's a, it is a hope. At least you know that now the responses in many parts of the world, the responses in many parts of the world, you can see that they have started to yield some result. So let's have the optimism that this is going to abate uh, we'll have much time to reflect upon it, but definitely the repercussions of whatever we have went through, that's going to last. There is no need to be apologetic about anything we did. There is no need to be regretful about whatever actions we have taken. We did what was good under these present circumstances. My hope is that everything will uh, return, life will slowly return to normal, and there will be a new normal maybe. And even if nothing returns, and we have to continue the classes online, we have to remain in home, humanity communicates only through the internet, even you have to consider that that a new normal, because new normal is very absolutely the norm of the global. We have always been facing new normals, right? When uh, smartphones came, that became the new normal. In 2000 or 2005 or 2006, there were no smartphones. So for people, the telephones with the buttons and the keys, they were actually, that, that was the normal. Now all of a sudden you have a new normal. Telephone is not the new normal. WhatsApp is the new normal. So no, you don't need to worry about that. So even if life continues in this way, well, that will become the, the, the new normal in, 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 in the global. Okay, now we have a very informed uh, question from Gurveer Singh Dinsa. He says, India sends supplies of anti-malaria drug hydrochloroquine to several nations, including the US. India is in the process of supplying hydrochloroquine to 55 coronavirus hit countries as grants as well as commercial basis. Seeing this, the United Nations chief applauded India for its efforts. So his question is, sir, do you think after this pandemic, India will emerge as one of the global leaders in the world? Okay. It's a big a, a political question as well. I mentioned during my presentation that one of the unique features of the global is that the senders, previously what was considered to be the sender of power, there was a substantial shift. Substantial shift from that. I'm not naming any particular region of the globe, but previously we thought that, I mean, the West is the sender, but the sender of the world has substantially been moving off late. Even before the pandemic, it has substantially been moving actually. 
So now the new senders of the world probably are China, Russia, India, Brazil, uh, South Africa. So new senders have always been emerging. In. There is an, that, as I said, that the states are trying to move more and more inward. And internally, if you are coherent, I mean, definitely in, in, in the global world, you can emerge. This is exactly the reason why India, China, Brazil, and uh, uh, the South Africa are emerging as a global leaders. But India has shown a remarkable uh, you know, response uh, uh, in terms of th through its global imagination. India has thrown a remarkable response to the COVID-19 than many other countries, especially some smaller states down south. They have shown absolutely remarkable response to this. So that shows that they are good in decision making. And in global, what exactly you what exactly makes you a, 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 a power or what exactly makes your might important or may, what exactly gives you a prominence is actually your response and your logical decision making there i think india has shown that it is really good in that and india never has any india has no abundance of sorry no lack of abundance of resources so definitely you can see that in in due course i mean already the senders and the peripheries are shifting actually what what were deemed to be the peripheries are now becoming the senders and the old senders are now becoming the peripheries much better days are ahead for states like India. Great, sir. So, so I, I, I didn't answer. I, I know this question can only be answered in a broader way because at the moment yeah. you, you, I don't have adequate information to exactly predict where India is going to emerge. But this is only going to add to this trend of the shifting centers and the shifting peripheries, which will be beneficial for a state like India. Yeah. Okay. So Devanshi Patodia from you know uh, I, I don't know her city, but Devanshi Patodia is asking a question. As you said, COVID-19 is shifting us towards inward globalization. Uh, so she she's asking. So you don't don't you think it's a harm to various economies of the world? So here's a law student who's probably thinking also about economy. Sorry, could you repeat the last part of that statement? So don't you think it is a harm to various economies of the world, COVID-19 and the economic scenario? That's the question all about. So she's asking that you said that COVID-19 is shifting us towards okay. inward global. So she's trying to ask you about what. Yeah, what, what so is that's, yeah understood, understood the question. So that's, an, that's more a political point, actually, this inwardness. And you look around. Uh, at the point, we thought that when globalization came, we thought that we are all going to be one under one leader, under one government, we'll have a common bank. These were the kind of imaginations that were floating at that point. But off late, there is a discontentment. I mean, of course, discontent, discontentment of globalization has already been expressed by many scholars, including many economists. We feel that we are losing many things in the process of becoming global. We are losing our values. We are losing our morals. We are losing our identities. We are becoming greedy. We are becoming self-centered. We are also becoming competitive, but we are also becoming you know, uh, disturbed. Uh, you know, uh, uh, entropy individuals. So these are all been, uh, you know, the concerns. So at some point, the globalization reached its tipping point that there is no more expansion. And then the states decided that, no, we need to go back because the bliss of being on your own is the finest bliss you can get. There is nothing better than being your own. Why would I try to eat McDonald's when I'm when I'm more comfortable eating Belia? <laughs> so you, you began to feel that a lot of fake things have been there, there are so many superimpositions on you so many fake things which do not belong to you have been imposed on you you have become that being which you in fact were not and even then being in these uh, opulent in, in these conditions of opulence in these conditions of uh, luxury conditions of uh, uh, you know uh, i mean economic vibrancy you began to feel that you are losing something so that uh, Thought, that collective part of that humanity is actually what prompted many to go back. Even states were also feeling uncomfortable because of the global standards which were being imposed upon the states. They were failing to preserve their indigeneity. They were failing to preserve their culture, failing to preserve their tradition. They were failing to preserve their intelligence. So the states decided that, no, this is not the way the globalization has to happen. Let us go back. And people started to go back. So Americanness, Indianness, Britishness and look at the uh, uh, look at uh, the, the grand narrative in Europe. European Union was actually trying to find a homogeneous identity for the entire euro. But there are many states like France and Germany felt that we don't fit into this grand narrative. We have to somehow stand out of it. Frenchness is not Europeanness. Germanness is not Europe. It started a journey backwards in history. And in journey backwards in history, they found that there is a very good historical point whereby the true French identity can be discovered. They decided to consider that as the, uh, the, the, the beginning point of the narrative or the French narrative or the German narrative. India too, we are also doing the same. You know, the, 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 the schemes like Make in India is nothing but an effort to rediscover the Indianness. But of course, how you perceive your Indianness 
that that also is a political question but the true effort of these states and the individuals are actually to go back to your own universal self and to look at the world but in that process many times you will find that there is a historically advantageous moment let me stay there and let me use the historically advantageous point as my as my uh, uh, you know the, the perspective to look at the world so inward globalization is actually not uh, harming economy in any manner Inward globalization is only boosting, I mean, strengthening the economies, but nations are actually rediscovering their indigeneity. It creates your indigenous potential and indigenous imagination, and actually that indigeneity is going to come back to the global, making you much more productive here. So I do not think that inward globalization is in any way going to affect the economy, but inwardness is a trend, and I'm sure that someday this inwardness may also change. But now, previously we used to say that international law. So now we say that we have Russian international law, Chinese approach to international law, Indian approach to international law, the Brazilian approach to international law. So states come and practice international relations and international law with their own respective internalization of international law. So inwardness definitely is not a bad sign. It is again yet another phase of globalization as the many other weird phases of globalization you have seen. Great. So Udita Dubey also had a similar question. So Udita, I'm not asking you a question again because I think it has already been answered. So Gurveer has again asked a question, which is very interesting. And uh, being the vice dean of the law school, I think you are an, and someone I've seen doing a lot of research also, you'll be able to give a better answer. He's asking, since Jinder Global University is a research intensive university, how are the students included in the process? Okay, fantastic. That's a, that's a wonderful question actually uh, asked by Gurveer. So let me put it, uh, in, uh, let me start with a little, a little philosophical tone. Why do we do research? So research, I mean, the, 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 the plain answer is that uh, uh, research, uh, by, by research, you multiply the knowledge, you mutate the knowledge. Well, that's not the real reason why you do research. When you do research, you actually discover yourself. Every line you write in your article, in your research, is actually your own representation in the larger social traction. So if you aesthetically view research, you know that research means a lot. So anything you write, where uh, anything you write, from your own representation, that actually makes much meaningful research. I'm soon going to come to your question. So I would say that you have to approach research in a way that I have a voice, I have an idea, and I want to speak that. Now use your research actually to speak that. But the problem is that simply you speak, nobody is going to listen to a Gurveer or to a Srijit or to a Deepu. Nobody is interested in that. You have to say that your idea can be located in that body of knowledge which the world is largely familiar with. So you have to approach research like that. So research is nothing but you manifesting, you getting a space to represent yourself. Previously, you had no space of representation. Now you are getting a space of representation. So in general global law school, we believe that everyone has this great potential. Everyone has a research potential. So in classes, starting with the assignments itself, we strongly promote the research. So you know that in all the law schools, there is a paper called the legal methods. I particularly as the vice dean of the school ensures that the best faculty members, my best faculty members, of course, I mean that the faculty members who have done years of experience doing research and publication, they teach this paper because it's not all about teaching the methodology, it's about sharing their own aesthetic and phenomenological experiences of doing research with the students. So if you can wake up every morning, read, your, read the line you wrote last night and fall in love with it, I'm sure you're heading towards a great researcher. Because as much as you dress up your body before a public function or before going for a public function, you have to dress up your prose, your thoughts in that way. So in general global university, research starts at your classroom. Apart from that, there are numerous opportunities. All the faculty members of general global law school are outstanding researchers. So these outstanding researchers have their own researchers. So many of them involve students in their research. Now, how this involvement starts? It may start with simple material collection. But more importantly, you question, one may wonder what will I gain by simply collecting materials and giving to my professor finally just to get an acknowledgement in a footnote that this person acted as my research assistant. Through that process, you are actually learning how a scholar brings an idea to life. So the professor may start with a very loose idea. That idea may be you know, absolutely weird, but how the professor makes otherwise an, uh, an idea, a weird idea or a, or a very cherished idea into an acceptable res research paper into an acceptable knowledge, to an acceptable wisdom. That process actually you learn when you do research assistance with a professor. So number one, through your different classroom assignments, through the courses, uh, research oriented courses, you are going to learn research. Number two, associating with the professor's own research, you are going to learn how a professor manifests their own ideas into solid research. Now the third is, Jindal Global Law School has approximately 30 research centers. 
most of the research centers are very active. They organize conferences, they publish papers, they, uh, they, they, they do journal symposiums. In all these activities, students are welcome. All the students need is simply express their interest to the uh, executive director of the center and take part in that. Now, apart from that, um, you know, you, you might have heard this term making the law review. So law review means a law journal. Every university has a law journal. Uh, Jindal University has its own law journals, actually. I mean, it has Jindal Journal of International and Comparative Law, Jindal Global Law Review. It has Jindal uh, Review of Historical Studies. In all these journals, we ensure that the students play an editorial role. Please note that you are not assisting. You're playing an editorial role. That means that students learn to read the articles submitted by the authors. They are taught how to proofread an article, how to correct the footnotes, how to correct the syntax how to correct the semantics, how to correct the grammar, you learn all this editorial process. You learn this editorial work, which will make you even a better writer. So another opportunity is actually associating with a law review or a law journal. As I told you, the classes, professors research, research centers, and most importantly, law review. Uh, if you are an aspiring law student, you should know that being the editor of a law journal is a high merit, is a merit of the highest order, uh, especially if you are an editor in chief. So many times, as uh, the editor, uh, the editor in chief of a law review, you will find that unless it is a peer journal, it will be a student. The editor in chief of the Harvard Law Review is a student. The editor in chief of the Yale Law Journal is a student. Editor in chief for Stanford Law Review is a student. And President Obama was also the editor in chief uh, at that point. That the, the title was president of Harvard Law Review. So it brings extreme merit to you. But law review is the last stage. You have to actually start with uh, internalizing your courses. Now, finally. Uh, I once offered a course called a playful approach to legal research. My effort was that I wanted to make research look fun because the research has to, as I said, it has to come from your inner self. Research has to be joyful. It has to be playful and you have to play with the, the, with the prose. You have to play with, uh, you know, the, the, the readings. Research makes even, even, you know, your, your existence much more blissful at that point. So please make use of all these opportunities wherever you are. Okay, so the next question, I'm very sure you're going to enjoy a lot. The question is, what are some of your book recommendations for students before starting law school? Having known you personally, and oh, having the kind of avid reader that you are, I'm very sure you're going to enjoy answering yeah, this I, question. I love that question. I absolutely love that question. There are many things you can read. So there is something called reading law and reading around the law. So I would strongly advise you that you have to read around the law. So this is what you have to do before you come to the law school. But before reading, I, I'm sure that you have watched all those classic uh, law school movies like Paper Chase with honors. So this will give you a larger sense of what a classic American or a, or a, or a uh, you know, uh, law, an American law school, uh, particularly Harvard Law School of the 1970s was like. But if you want to read more about, uh, about the law, the first book I would advise you to read is, it's an article actually by one of the, uh, the students of Boston University College of Law. It's called In Pursuit of Gold Star. The Diary of a Law Student, In Pursuit of the Gold Star, The Diary of a Law Student. This was published in Unbound Harvard Journal of the Legal Left. The next book you have to read is by Judge Richard Posner, Overcoming Law. This is a little bit, uh, I mean, a book which is fit to be read in the law school, but still there is no harm in reading that. You have to read this book, Overcoming Law. Next one, a, a, a very complex article, but I mean, the, the, don't don't go by the complexity. The, the, the complexity will finally give it to a very sweet understanding because of the legal beauty here. The title of the paper is Path of the Law. Path of the Law, published in Harvard Law Review, 1897, more than 120 years uh, back, this piece was published. The Path of the Law by Just, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. This was published in Harvard Law Review in 1997. I would also recommend a few uh, novels also about the law and about the about the global at large. So one is a novel called Invisible Power, a philosophical adventure story by Professor Philip Allot. He's professor of law in Cambridge University, uh, United Kingdom. And also Invisible Power 2, a metaphysical adventure story, again by Professor Philip Allot. Both are novels. Both are going to give you extraordinary approach to law before you go to the law school. And then a very interesting piece written by Professor Lone Fuller in Harvard Law Review, The Mysterious Case of Spellsian Explorers. In order to know how judges think, you have to read this piece. It will help you uh, understand a lot about what works behind a judgment. Why judges give a certain judgment? Is the judgments that neutral or are judgments conditioned by factors other than judicial mindset? So you have to read this piece. This is a brilliant article. Sorry, a brilliant article. Harvard Law Review, 1949, The Case of Spellensian Explorers. I mean, these are all the things I could quickly recollect. 
and uh, also a very interesting book by uh, Professor uh, Richard Taller and Professor Cass Sunstein, uh, Nudge. This is a popular, uh, uh, this, is a, this is a bestseller, so which will tell you actually why, I mean, I made this point actually, why law should now move away from being bans and mandates or from the form of bans and mandates and it should adopt uh, a, a rational choice model or why law is actually information essential to make your rational choice. This book gives you so many interesting anecdotes and illustrations and hypos which will help you better understand the global times. So this, the name of the book is Nudge by Professor Cass Sunstein and uh, Richard Taller. Another interesting piece is in Harvard Law Review 2013. I don't, I don't remember the name of the author. It's called The Shallow Signals. Uh, Shallow Signals is the name of the book. It, act, it actually tells you that there are times when law fails to communicate its true feelings to the people. So what is seemingly communicated to the law is not exactly what the law wanted to communicate, but law has also certain sweet feelings which the language of the law cannot communicate. So please read this piece in Harvard Law Review called Shallow Signals. So these are some of the things which you can read around the law. They don't take you directly into the heart of the legal discourse, but it will show you the world around the law. With these internalizations, if you come to the law school and start to study the law, your experience of the law school is going to be absolutely great. Great. I think uh, Bhavya Vyas was the one who asked this question and she has asked a question which many students had in their mind and might not have thought. So thank you Bhavya for that question which has received a very apt answer from sir. I'm sure some of you might have wrote those down as in those uh, book names in case you have not done that. What I could do is I'll request Professor Srijit to just you know shoot a mail to us. We'll make sure that all the entire list reaches you after the session. Okay. So the next question is by Saminder sure. Singh. Saminder has a question where he's asking, uh, my question is how does completion of global law helps me in various fields to be looked at tomorrow? What is a global platform I see if I pursue this from OP Jindal? Okay, so I said that, um, I mean, the first thing a human being needs is to know where he or she is situated. By situate, situationality, let me call this expression, uh, use this expression situationality. By situationality, I mean being aware of where you are. That's the first thing you need. So if you come to a law school without even knowing what exactly is the, your situationality or what exactly are the circumstances in which we live. Circumstances also mean, you know, the thought process of human beings. There is no point in learning law. You read Indian Penal Code, you will think that, well, it tells me certain do's and don'ts. Indian Penal Code says, do this, do that. Don't do this, don't do that. But if you read Indian Penal Code with a slightly a rational mind, you will, fee you will see that Indian Penal Code never tells you don't do anything. Right, Indian Penal Code never tells you don't do anything. It never says, says that those shall not steal like the Ten Commandments. It simply says that if you steal, you will be punished with seven years imprisonment. There is nothing more than that. So here, Indian Penal Code tells you to make a rational choice. If you can afford to be behind the bars, you can do that. And if you cannot afford that, go, don't steal. So it is a very, very rational and I mean, a little bit funny approach to look at the law. So I'm saying that the first thing you need to understand is that what exactly is the circumstances in which we live? What exactly is the time? So here comes the relevance of the global law. So in Jindal Global Law School, every course, criminal law, civil law, law of evidence, uh, Indian penal equipment that that becomes part of criminal law, public international law, um, international trade law, family law, law of torts. All these, uh, I mean, these, these branches of law are designed with the global perspective. So I need not tell you now what exactly is this global perspective. Global perspective is perspectives about the time in which you live. So this global perspective is going to be extremely useful for you here what you are learning is not about what is happening i mean what exactly is the is the knowledge there but you have actually gained a perspective this perspective is going to be useful to you wherever you go in, in irrespective of the jurisdiction so you may think i studied indian penal code can i go and uh, practice criminal law you can because you have actually got that perspective which we call as the global perspective this global perspective is going to help you anywhere in this time unless the time changes substantially, but global time, as I said, global time is not going to change. This After this, more global time will come. After that, even more global time will come. So, evade surprises, gain the perspective, learn to understand, learn to grapple with those surprises. That's exactly lies the wisdom. That's exactly lies the key of understanding uh, the global law of lies. Okay, uh, there is a question from Nishant Kumar. He is asking, sir, if it is found that China did this coronavirus spreading malice to benefit itself, 
to become a global power can we see a situation in future where other countries are going to do the same uh, <laughs> it's a, a very difficult question. I mean, and also because it's a very clear uh, internal uh, question. I mean, this question I can only answer when I'm a decision maker for a certain state. But again, <laughs> even we are not sure. It is not all like, you know, I mean, as of now, so many conspiracy theories are going around. But I would just uh, 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 cut short that question with a good reading for you, which you have to read actually. So if you believe China did that, or if you believe China uh, didn't do that, to better appreciate the Chinese decision-making process, I would strongly encourage you to, to read a book called The Governance of China by the Chinese President uh, Xi Jinping. Please read that book. This is going to be extremely useful. The book is available in Amazon. This book will give you, this book, book won't tell you whether China did this or China did, this, uh, China did not do this, but this book will give you a, a perspective to look at Chinese decision-making, the Chinese polity, the Chinese foreign policy. I mean, I cannot say anything more on this question. Please do read this book. The name of the book is Governance of China. Extremely simple and extremely easy to understand. You don't need to be a, a political theorist or a political scientist in order to understand this particular book. Please do read it. It was, I mean, it helped me a lot in order to understand the Chinese perspective, uh, uh, particularly the Chinese approach to international. Another question from Bhavya. Bhavya is asking us, how does a law degree at general compare to an LLB at other research-based universities such as London School of Economics and Political Science? Well, as I said, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, the, what, what is unique about the Jindal University is our middle name, global, and the perspective we bring with it. So, it, it, I mean, what exactly matters here is that, you know, in order to appreciate the research, in order to appreciate whatever you are reading, you need to have an insightful mind. And this insightful mind, you have actually to construct. You know, you have to construct that. You have to build an insightful mind during your law school days. So I would say that the difference between an LLB and an LLM here is that in LLB, you gain the foundational knowledge. LLM gives you a thoughtful approach to law. I mean, this was my personal experience because when I read LLM, I understood that, well, there were better ways to learn my LLB had I got this this kind of an insight during the LLB days, my law school would have been far better. Well, uh, I mean, I didn't go to a national law school. Of course, I belong to an old generation, the 1990 uh, law school product, the 1990s law school product. So I, I literally regret at that point, had I got that thought. Today, we are sensing it. So we are ensuring that the students get the best insights. Now, what if, in what way this is differentiated from a London School of Economics or a research intensive university? Jindal is also a research intensive university. London School of Economics is also. Universities are largely, if you investigate into the, the etymology of this expression university, you will find that in the 12th century, people found that there should be an institutionalized framework to ask big questions. Big questions uh, means astronomical questions. Where the universe came from? Where are we going? When did time start? What exactly is this big bang? So in order to ask these big questions, universities were created. Universities continue to ask these questions. No doubt they continue to ask the thing is that some universities take research so seriously, some universities do not take. But then the not taking research seriously is not a deficiency because you know that research comes from an insight and Jindal Global Law School provides that insight. The same insight is also provided by London School of Economics. So it's what you need is a thoughtful approach. What makes a university intensive, uh, intensive in terms of research and not intensive in terms of research is actually the thought that brings it, the thought. Or if, if, I mean, if the thought is not exactly philosophy, the thought is actually, you know, that a little bit rigor, a little bit deeper, a little bit, uh, you know, imaginative. That's what I mean by the insight. So before I move on to the next question and give it to you, sir, I'll give you a small rest since you've been speaking. I'll just take one question and I'll quickly just, uh, you know, answer it. Uh, Prerna was sure. asking us how to go about preparing for LSAT. Prerna, uh, you can sit at home and prepare for LSAT absolutely for free. Because there is this uh, organization you might have heard about, a US-based organization called as Khan Academy. So they have a free prepare, uh, free tutorial for LSAT, which is available online, which you can sit at home and you can prepare it's for LSAT International. But then the classes and the subject and everything else is very much similar for LSAT India also. So please do attend those classes. What we'll do is after the session, we're going to send you a mail where we're going to send you that uh, link course. So you can sit at home and you know you can prepare. Okay, so that's how preparation for LSAT is done. So moving on to the next question, uh, again from Gurveer. Gurveer is asking us, uh, 
Jindal Global Law School is the number one law school in India. Thank you uh, for being that updated. We have been ranked by QS, which is an international uh, body. What and the question is, what makes Jindal Global Law School different from NLUs? Is it the commitment towards globalism and international collaboration which enhances the exposure of a student or some other factors? So I think this question um, was already answered by our vice chancellor yeah. in one of the previous um, uh, webinars. And I take the same stance. I cannot comment about another university because I know only about Jindal. So Jindal, I would say that certain major points and we believe that those points and in, in our ex, our focus on that, that points and our commitment to those actually made Jindal Global Law School uh, the number one probably. So I'll let me tell you. First of all is the faculty members. So in recruiting the faculty members, we particularly ensure that our faculty members have global approach. That's something which we definitely look at that. So all faculty members have this broadened outlook. They are well read. They are very aware of what exactly are the circumstances in which they live. They are imaginative and they have a rigor in their thought and in their speech. This is the first point we look at that extremely high qualified luminous individuals. This is the number one point because you know that to become the best, you need to be taught by the best. So we follow this policy and definitely we, 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 we take care of that during our recruitment process. Second one is actually research. Definitely, as I've said that Jindal is a research intensive university. The 30 research centers which Jindal has extremely uh, committed to the promotion of the knowledge. And I already mentioned that all the research centers approach research as a process of knowledge building, a process of uh, identity formation and also a process of uh, you know, uh, making the world a better place. So research is the second one. The third is international collaborations. International collaborations means you know that you know your world, not the globe, you know the world. So you should also know the best practices. You should collaboratively work with each other. You should also learn how others respond to the, 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 the global in the way you respond. to. And the third one, the, the recruitments. Definitely, you know that uh, recruitments matter because uh, recruitments, is, I mean, it's a job definitely, but more than a job, it's actually the opportunity you are actually getting, uh, uh, an opportunity you are getting to fulfill the social responsibility and also an opportunity to use the legal knowledge and the insights and the outlook you have gained being in a law school. So these are the four pillars actually on which the strength of any law school lies. It's uh, faculty, research, international collaborations, and recruitments. So I guess we've reached the end of the session and the questions are also, you know, uh, there's one more question, sir, by Arun Arora. He's asking, uh, studying in Australia and studying in India for law, what is your opinion and counsel? Uh, knowing Jindal is a research-based institution, would pursuing a degree from Jindal be comparable with Australian education? Okay, so uh, there, there are a lot of commonalities actually, and it is these commonalities actually which prompted Jindal actually to enter into many collaborations with Australian universities. So Jindal Global uh, Law School has a center called the India Australia Studies Center. And India Australia Study Center indulges in um, uh, uh, through the India Australia Study Center, we actually get into mutual research, uh, collaborative research, collab joint projects, uh, you know, joint research, joint conferences, and joint degrees. So uh, a student who is pursuing actually an LLB from Jindal Global Law School has an opportunity to move through a pathway to go to an Australian university to study their LLM program. So instead of the five years you spend actually in the law school, you complete all the courses which are required by the regulatory body in India in four years, and then you move to the Australian University for completing your LLM. So in five years time, you are getting both an LLM and an LLB. Now this becomes possible because of the comparable standards, because of the comparable quality, which both the universities follow. Now definitely, as I said, that Australian universities, um, uh, I mean, I mean, the, the very Australianness of the Australian universities are there because Australian universities will have to teach the functions of the law in an Australian society. We also teach the functions of law in an Indian society, but the global is actually going, the global outlook is actually going to be the link between both the jurisdictions. So now the subject matter may vary, but the approach, the outlook no, doesn't change. Okay, uh, so I think this is the last question, sir, after which we can you know, call it a day. Uh, the question comes from uh, Gurveer again. He's asking, how can a lawyer in the modern world remain politically correct and have an unbiased opinion about various policies within the country and outside it? And also, is it important? Um, politics, yes. Uh, 
correctness i mean in the global or in the modern world there is nothing which is uh, correct or which is uh, which, which i mean with which a correctness can be attributed i mean wh whatever decision that fetches favorable outcomes you call it correct because i said that there is nothing like a like an objective truth in the modern world uh, so correctness and wrongness i mean these are definitely simply two perceptions now two sides of a coin so uh, whatever fetches the best outcome you have to call it the correctness now when when it comes to the question of politics uh, i would speak it from the perspective of my discipline international law so in international law there was a time when politics was kept outside law all considerations of politics were kept outside law at that point when world moved into this late modernity there was a big fall and as part of fall all those ideas which international law cherished they too collapsed and a famous finnish professor with the name marty koskinen wrote a brilliant book absolutely brilliant book which which became one of the most influential book on international law during the 20th and 21st century that book is called from apology to utopia from apology to utopia the structure of international legal arguments so in this book he said that if you have the awareness that you live in a global world if you have the awareness that you live in late modernity it's very difficult for you to believe in whatever you have studied till now whatever you have held till now i'm saying about the late modern or the pre modern uh, or the pre global knowledge so he said that now you face a deep identity crisis you find yourself in a binary and he named these binaries one is called naive objectivity another is nihilism if you know the truth you are going to face nihilism because you do not have faith anymore in the old system otherwise you have to remain ignorant if you remain ignorant you can be naively objective you can naively cling to the old notions but if you know the truth if you are like that platonian cave dweller who saw the reality and came back to the the world you actually have to be nihilistic now one way to overcome your nihilism is that you embrace the politics because politics gives you subjectivity there is no more objectivity so standing with the politics i would say that there is absolutely nothing wrong in that but politics you have to understood in the proper sense so here by politics we mean the world of subjectivities the world of choices the world of uh, uh, effective outcomes so there is nothing like politically incorrect or politically correct being part of politics or being part of the political i would say is actually very much part of a lawyer's life today or very much part of a legal scholar anybody who works with law part of their life i would strongly encourage you to read this book by professor marty koskinen uh, from apology to utopia the structure of international legal arguments there is a lot of background to that book a lot of story before and after that book at the moment my time doesn't permit me to say that but i would strongly encourage you to read that but please understand being political is nothing wrong for a lawyer anymore late modernity or the global times demand it okay great uh, so tarika sai has a question which is about economy uh, so guys this is going to be a final question i am so sorry because we are running we have already overshoot at the time so don't worry about it we are going to hold more lectures like this right on 28th uh, Uh, after this session, what we're going to do is we're going to send you a mail which will have a registration link for our next lecture. Also, this is a lecture series which is going to run till May, you know, till this lockdown period is there. So we're going to run it. So you know, you can hold your uh, questions together because there are some questions which I'm omitting intentionally because they are again being repeated. Sir has already answered it in his lecture and he has already answered it here. So you know, someone is asking me how are we going to get hold of financial recession? How are we going to come back? so there is no hard and fast answer for this question first of all and moreover sir will answer from his perspective and he will tell you that those answers but the entire session and the objective or else the the the, the entire topic of this session was on global law right so that's exactly what we are looking at so most of the questions which have come on that way we have entertained them and you know you can further research on more there there are going to be more sessions on the same so i'll just take one final session sir with your permission sir i hope you you're okay with that sure sure yeah okay so the last question is uh about the new technologies which is changing the industry and the automation which is changing the dynamics of professions etc so again by arun arun is asking us it how is the change in dynamics of industries and profession how is it going to impact the career in law for example you know uh, artificial intelligence etc so that's what he's hinting at so indeed i uh, um this i mean i think that my uh, in the beginning itself probably i i try to clarify this away surprises 
Right, and then it surprised us in this global. And why we need the framework of global law is simply that we accommodate major avalanches, major massive shifts in technology, in culture, in human behavior, in terms of human approaches to life, everything. So it has that framework. Well, I'm definitely not a technology lawyer that I can answer this question, but there will be a time when, yes, artificial intelligence or even much more super technologies will actually change the way we look at things. But simply that global law gives you a framework to accommodate all that. Let me try to answer this question uh, from the perspective of uh, aviation law, a discipline which is close to my heart. The entire civil aviation, that means uh, that also includes the operations of the planes, are governed by a convention called the Chicago Convention. Otherwise, this convention is called as the Convention on Civil Aviation. This convention was enacted in the year 1944, when cockpits were literally steam cockpits, not even the, the not even the say the, the modern class cockpits. So the law is quite redundant. So today, if you try to read Chicago Convention and try to apply the clauses of the Chicago Convention to a modern airplane or the modern civil aviation, I mean, you may not be able to exactly apply. For example, Chicago Convention requires that the pilot shall carry the necessary maps and charts uh, and uh, of the airport and the destination of the destination airport with them. Now, you know that in a modern uh, cockpit, particularly an Airbus cockpit or a Boeing cockpit, they don't carry the maps because every information comes to the computer because the plane is today flown with much more automation than it used to be in the past so if you strictly follow this clause of the chicago convention you cannot so what do you do you actually follow the chicago convention in its spirit the spirit is that there shall be essential information with the pilot about the airport on which the plane is going to land that's the simple spirit of it so when you read law you have to actually read it with a pink sword so what appears as truth is not the truth there may be many hidden truths within that that's how you have to approach. So I would say that global law, much like the Chicago Convention, it gives you a framework, a framework within which all super technologies and super, super technologies of the future or super, super considerations of the future can be accommodated. So in other sense, I said that global law is a sensibility. It is actually a flexibility. It is actually your own approach and openness of your mind to accommodate and a preparedness on your part, come whatever, you are ready now. You feel that you have the adequate imagination and competency to deal with that. That's what the global law provides. Great, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Sir handles one of the most important offices in our uh, law school, and uh, he has been very busy because we started with our online classes. So thank you so much, sir, for sparing time for us and taking this lecture and enlightening all the students. We're very thankful to you. Thankful to all the students who have stayed up till late. The questions which we could not answer, don't be disappointed. You know, there were repeat questions which came in. So we'll be providing you with the recording of the session also. Plus that, I also want to request you all that on 28th April, we are again going to bring back another professor of our law school, uh, Dr. Wesley Popowski. He is an ex-diplomat who's going to come and deliver a lecture on law and governance of COVID-19. So, you know, the kind of international expertise and the academic experience which Dr. Wesley Popowski has, he's going to come and answer to many of the questions which could not be answered today because they were repeat questions, but from a very different perspective. Getting it? So, we'll be sending you the registration link with the mail which follows after this session. So, you can register for the same and, uh, you know, you can attend the session and you can uh, get answers to many more queries as well. So, thank you, sir. Thank you to each one of you. And uh, I hope we, you know, all the sessions are attended by all the students and you get maximum benefit out of this brilliant venture of ours. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.